Others are being presented. Yes, this is our chance to recognize all the men and women who have served in the different branches of the armed forces. So as she said, when you hear the song representative of your branch of the armed forces, please stand and be recognized.
makers, our voice of democracy, essay makers, with the question being, what is our greatest attributes in our democracy? In third place, our senior, Colton Archibald, with his, and his essay will be read by sophomore Claire Lund. Now, 
please direct your attention to our GES fifth grade choir as they will be seen when they are in tears.
Thank you, fifth graders. Now for our second place winner, senior Tara O'Reilly. Okay.
Our first place winner is senior Alan Tolles. We, the people of the United States of America, are the first several words in the U.S. Constitution preamble. Our democracy is based on power from the people. Naturally and consequentially, some of the best things about our government is that it reflects the people's needs. The greatest attributes of our democracy are the right to free speech, legal protections against discrimination, and the provision of a free public education. First. The relative right to free speech plays an important role in our day-to-day -day lives. The First Amendment and the Bill of Rights is one of the most utilized rights by Americans. It is key to the, to the decision of which president to vote for. Candidates must express their plans in order for citizens to vote on a candidate that best represents their beliefs. It makes a debate and spread of new ideas and findings possible. It allows people to be critical and bring about improvement. However, this right is relative and limits are placed on. Regulations prevent the potential chaos that would be caused by an absolute freedom of speech. The government has a responsibility to punish certain types of unprotected speech. Saying untrue, damaging things about someone can be deemed illegal and unpunishable. Conspiracy involving a committed crime can have consequences as well. In short, Americans desire expression and individuality that no persecution from others or the government as a result of their self-expression. Additionally, we also do not want to be unfairly discriminated against. Since our government allows for diversity, it means the ability to protect people against persecution. Our country citizens identify with a variety of ethnicities, beliefs, and cultures. These differences are what prejudices are based on, and possibly from those prejudices comes the mistreatment of people. However, our government has never run the list of protections against discrimination by race, sex, religion, and any other matters. If some of these protections were not in the original Constitution, as they were fought for, then the protections begin from Supreme Court decisions that have discrepancies between the law and the Constitution. But the bottom line is that the protections our government offers originate from the people's concerns. All protections would not exist without the people's determination to establish and support them. The government has a responsibility to provide for the well being of its citizens. And for a healthy democracy, anti discrimination laws are essential. And so is education. Lastly, the government makes education widely available by supporting and helping to establish public schools. Its support is largely monetary, which helps keep public schools open and accessible. Public schools broaden opportunities for children and teenagers as they are places to learn social, critical thinking, and reasoning skills gain knowledge in a variety of subjects. Many public school students enter higher education to pursue a career that supports their needs and helps society. Kids in the U.S., regardless of economic status, are able to have that opportunity because of public schools. Furthermore, education system is essential to our democracy. Take the word of the classical Greek philosopher, Socrates, who was staunchly against democratic forms of government, but made a good point to where its success arrives. He said that democracy depends on the education of the average citizen. This thought from thousands of years ago is still relevant today. If we cannot critically think about matters while distinguishing fact from fiction and also considering other sides of an argument, our democracy is simply unsustainable. Our education system provides the tools to appropriately handle disagreements and sort through confusion. So through the resources our government gives to our schools, kids are able to have an accessible, free education. The best our democracy has to offer is our First Amendment rights, protections against discrimination, and, and, and an accessible education system. The framers of the U.S. Constitution had the well-being of the common person in mind and created. They had a goal to satisfy the needs and values of as many people as possible with a highly functional and efficient government, or a more perfect human. This task is extremely difficult and will never be our government is simply not perfect, and never will be. However, there is no denying what our country has achieved in part that you hope you 
It provides a broad range of freedoms and opportunities for those who want to utilize them. That is fundamentally American. Thank you.
Maguire. All right, please welcome our guest speaker, Michael Zillow. He was captain in the US, uh, United States Army from 2001 to 2008. Uh, deployed with the 29th Signal Battalion to support Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004, and deployed with the 1st Special Forces Group to support Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2006. All right, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say uh, thanks to the Color Guard. Uh, thanks to the band, the choir, fifth graders for helping out over there. That takes a lot of guts. And the uh, student council for putting this on. Now I'm going to uh, talk about myself for about the next hour and a half here. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so how do I become a better? Uh, when I was a junior in high school, when Miss Morris was actually my trig teacher, I had uh, Mr. Bob Peters, our uh, guidance counselor, come up to me and say, Hey, Mike, got uh, this thing called Army or ROTC scholarships. Do you mean interested? I don't know. I'm not really, I wasn't really thinking about the Army at the time. It wasn't really something that was on my radar. I was yeah, um, not that I in this military, just not something that I was really thinking about. And I started looking at colleges, different things, uh, looking at my future, decided, Hey, I think I want to go into engineering. I decided to go to Iowa State University to be an engineer. Started looking at the, uh, the price of college and thought, hmm, man, maybe, I need, maybe I need a scholarship to, to help pay for this. Back in that day, it was, I think, $15,000 a year, which is nothing to just to figure it out. Uh, so, again, Bob Peters came up to me a few uh, weeks later and said, hey, Michael, what do you think about the service? He started telling me a little bit more about it and said, hey, um, when the way some of these ROTC scholarship works is you can, um, if you get a four-year scholarship or a three-year scholarship, that first year of college is paid for. If you decide if that freshman year is enough for you, fine, you can bow out. You can opt out of the program and get the first year paid for, no questions asked. Uh, all right, let's do this. This sounds good. So signed up, I had to um, apply, went to a bunch of different uh, uh, interviews, did some tests, things like that. Ended up getting an Army, Army, Army ROTC scholarship. Um, which for four years, and uh, I can use it wherever I want. I think they might be the same now, no idea. But I mean, you can, I, if you're getting college, I want to go to, they pay for four years. So, ended up going to Iowa State, uh, freshman year, we did we do some ROTC classes, they're like, I don't know, maybe an hour a semester or something like that. And I learned a lot, it was fun. There's uh, some camaraderie, just some, I got to meet people, interact with people I never, that I never would have on, you know, just the academic. Um, got to take some pretty interesting classes. I got to take some etiquette classes. I learned how to like use the correct fork and how to butter my bread properly and all that stuff. I never would have learned anywhere else. Um, so came to would have been spring my freshman year when I had to decide, hey, is this is this something I want to do? Do I want to continue on in, in the military? Talked to my parents about it. I thought, yeah, let's I'll continue on. Why not? Let's do this. So made a commitment to, to stick with the Army ROTC. Uh, which meant a six-year commitment after I graduated. So but that was kind of a good deal, right? So two of the reasons why I stuck with ROTC was one, school was paid for. And two, I had a job when I got out. I didn't have to have to worry about sending applications, doing internships, anything like that. I knew I was gonna have a job as soon as I got out. So made a commitment in between my sophomore and junior year. I got to go to uh, airplane school at Fort Benning, Georgia. I got to jump out of airplanes five times. Uh, pretty fun, pretty cool, but it was pretty important doing that. Uh, then through my junior and senior year, went to Fort Lewis, Washington, where they do, uh, it's like a assessment period, it's like a seven week course, you get to do some land navigation, you get to do a bunch of different tests and stuff, and they kind of rapid stack you and figure out you know, what you're, what you're going to do when you're actually going to the, uh, going out to do. Uh, graduate, so, so I had a four year scholarship, uh, took me five years to graduate. Uh, so last year I had to be on my own, but uh, fifth year, graduated in May 2001. And same day at uh, graduation, about two hours later, ended up going, uh, getting my commission in, as a second lieutenant in the Army. Two weeks later, I got married. And then in November uh, 2001, I went to Fort, uh, or, excuse me, Fort Gordon, Georgia, where I went from the, uh, uh, off, the signal officer basic course. So I was a signal officer in the military, which in the Army, which is kind of like the IT, IT 
uh, people think of it like that, but set up communications, phones, voice, uh, networks, uh, secure networks, stuff like that, and uh, satellite communications, all that. Um, so, let's see, so, was at Fort Gordon for Intel March of 2002, and then was ended up being stationed at uh, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Fort Lewis, Washington, I was with the 29th Civil Battalion there, and there um, I was a platoon leader, so that means I was in charge, of probably like, I say in charge. I was, um, that had uh, about 40 soldiers with me, uh, and our mission was to establish secure communications um, out the field. So they would like come these with, um, you know, boxes on the back of them, and, and then it's all stuff. Well, in 2005, we got a uh, call saying, guess what? You guys are going to Iraq. So we got, um, we got in our training, got ready, um, and we deployed to Kuwait in 2004, January 2004, convoyed up, uh, did some training in Kuwait for a little bit, and convoyed up to uh, a lot of areas up in, um, just outside of uh, Baghdad, or outside of Baghdad. I just got the convoy through Baghdad on my birthday, so it was, um, then we were in in uh, Balad, and that ended up being the main like logistics hub for um, for the for the military in Iraq. And so we, what our job was was to set up the main communications, phone security, and all those different things for uh, for the American forces and our allied forces in the area. That June, all, all of January, or I'm sorry, all of 2004, so January, December, came back, uh, and then uh, in 2005, that was about. Um, so with the military, you kind of, you've got about a three to four year span where you're doing a job, or you're with a unit, or you're at a certain um, base. And so it was coming time for me to either, um, like I said, I had a six year commitment, I had been, been in three years, it was time to either, hey, figure out if I gotta go to school somewhere, go do some other thing, we gonna move somewhere, anywhere in the world, or are we gonna uh, try to stay, stay at Fort Lewis with another job. Um, so, back up a little bit, when I was at uh, at Balad, my first time in Iraq, um, got to work with uh, the special operations uh, world a little bit while we were there, helping set up their communications and everything, and I saw those guys and I thought, man, I'm going to do that. That looks really, that looks really good. I'm going to be part of that. So, um, 2005, came out to Iraq, first time, and they, um, and I knew I had a fellow officer that worked at the uh, First Social Forces Group there at Fort Lewis, Washington, said, hey, you might get an interview, got me an interview, and I'm getting, I'm getting a job as uh, I was working for uh, third battalion for social forces group at um, at Fort Lewis, Washington. So Green Berets, cool guys, right? Killers, I mean, uh, these guys are amazing. Uh, different mining elements, different mining just all these specialties, pretty, pretty cool guys, right? I was just a lowly sort of guy, I'm not saying I'm a Green Beret or anything like that, but it was really cool to work with them. So got to work with those guys, uh, that was 2005, and 2005, they called, hey, guess what? You guys are wondering. All right, so we ended up going um, to try to wrap in January 2006. Uh, we didn't have to convoy through, they dropped us in the helicopters and got to, um, we took over for, for the 5th Special Forces Group, which I don't know if you guys know, know a lot of history about uh, uh, Operation Iraq and Freedom, but they were the ones that went in right away with a lot of land on horseback with the other agencies and things like that really established that Special Forces um, uh, base and things like that. Anyhow. Uh, so January to, uh, I was there for about nine months, January to September with, um, with, with that unit. We came back in uh, September 2006 and then got to do a lot more uh, fun things with the unit. Got to uh, jump out of helicopters, got to jump out of some other airplanes, got to, some, got to shoot some people. Got to, so I just did a lot for those guys. Really, really great time. But then, another, my other three years left, right? It's time to figure out what you're going to do with your life. I thought, yeah, you know, it was, it was, it was hard enough to leave my Christina and my Tom when I was when I was in the army, and I couldn't imagine leaving my kids. So I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I enjoyed what I've been doing. You know, it's been fun, but I'm, I'm, I'm so um, I told myself though, if I was going to get out of the military, that I still want to help America. So I'm been fortunate enough to be able to, to have some jobs still do that, still help the warfighters. So I'm so I'm thankful for that. Um, as far as what I learned in the military, I guess two two things I want to leave with one. There's other jobs in the military. It's not just shooting guns, running fast, climbing trees, things like that. There's there's other jobs. If you want to be a truck driver, be a cook. If you want to be an engineer, a computer nerd, something like that. There's plenty of opportunities to do in the military, right? Um, and the other one is, you guys, older folks probably know this. 
We're lucky. We're lucky where we live. We've got great opportunities. It's the best country in the world. Don't ever be afraid to be patriotic. If you if you want to write, if, if you want to um, fly an American flag in your yard, go for it. If you want if you want to wear a shirt that's got an American flag on it, go for it. If you want to write a paper in class about how America is the greatest country in the world, please go for it. Don't ever be afraid or ashamed to be. Patriotic. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to our 2023 Veterans Day program. Students, please stay seated as the community members exit the gym. Thank you.